Good evening. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Museum of Modern Art. My name is Stuart Comer, Chief Curator for Media and Performance here at the museum. And it's my great, great pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening and also all of our visitors online viewing the live stream. Um, it's really a great joy for me to be able to bring together tonight's speakers, um, not least of all Tanya Bruguera, whose installation, performance installation, untitled Havana 2000 is currently on view upstairs on the second floor. I hope most of you have experienced the work. And then also two of the fellow travelers who've really helped, um, I think, play the role of both witness and interlocutor and, and crucial critic for Tanya's work as it's evolved over the last two decades. Uh, Gerardo Mosquera, who is a critic and curator um, from Havana, uh, whom I first met when this installation actually premiered in the Havana Biennial in 2000. He was one of the co-founders of the Biennial in 1984 and has gone on to have a major impact on the field. Uh, not least most recently, for those of you um, who might be able to get to Minneapolis in the next few days, uh, an exhibition he co-curated, co Adios Utopia, Dreams and Deceptions in Cuban Art Since 1950. Uh, we'll be closing at the Walker Art Center there in a couple of days. Um, he has published widely um, um, curated even more broadly internationally, um, but it's impossible to imagine any history of recent and contemporary Cuban art without his voice at the center of that discussion. Similarly, Claire Bishop has um, really, I think, been one of the most important theorists for Tanya's work, but also someone I know that Tanya has had an ongoing dialogue with as she's formulated a lot of the thinking um, and ideas behind this work. Um, Claire's perhaps best known book, Artificial Hells, uh, Participatory Art and the Politics of Spectatorship, actually includes a work of Tanya's uh, on the cover. And I think that book in particular gets to the heart of why, in part, we acquired this installation and why it's on view here today which I believe very strongly that this is a really key threshold in Tanya's work between an earlier period of performances in which her own body featured as the primary medium. This was a moment in which she was coming out of a very rich history of performance and art in uh, Cuba, but very much reenacting and reimagining um, the work of major figures like Ana Mendieta in particular, and really making that history a living one through her own body. Uh, as much as she was channeling art history, she was also channeling the lives of many people, um, many Cubans who'd come before her who were colonial subjects um, and people who had gone through great hardships. And much of this was, um, to some extent, rethought and reenacted through projects like The Burden of Guilt that you see here. But then in 2000, she was invited to participate in the Biennial um, in, the, uh, in a fortress in Havana that had housed a military prison where prisoners of conscience in particular had been executed and tortured. Uh, this actually predated the Castro regime and went back uh, many decades, if not centuries. But that said, uh, uh, in the Castro regime, um, prisoners of conscience in particular was subjected to these um, punishments. And as you see here on the site, um, it included a lot of these arched uh, tunnel-like spaces that were then used that year. Um, artists were offered those spaces to present their work for the Biennale. Uh, here you see the view looking out as well of the original space in which Untitled Havana was presented. Tanya will go into more detail shortly about exactly how this work was conceived and how it responded to the context of that particular moment. Um, but here you see the performers in 2000 in a piece that was very short-lived. Within a matter of hours, it was shut down by the Cuban authorities. Um, thankfully, I was one of a group of people that were able to see it in the few hours that it was available. And the work has really um, resonated very strongly in my consciousness ever since. So again, it is a tremendous pleasure to have been able to present it here at the museum. And I just wanted to give you a quick sense of what it took to reconstruct this piece, because this is something I know we'll get into in the discussion. Often there's a big debate about performance in the museum context. Um, what does it mean to acquire or to buy an artwork and ascribe a financial value to it when so much performance art had actually tried to eschew the market? What does it mean to bring in live performers now who are not on, in the original site? How does Midtown Manhattan relate to a military fortress in Cuba? These are all questions that we talked a lot about in great depth with Tanya as we developed this piece and really tried to think through the ethics and the politics of what it means to present such a staunchly political work in the context of 2018 here in New York City. 
I think what is so clearly powerful and central to Tanya's work is that although it might seem to be site-specific or specific to one political situation, actually the work is far more timeless than that. And the lessons that we can learn from this piece, the intense emotional and psychological responses that many viewers have had to the work, in fact transcend the political moment in Havana in 2000 and are quite applicable today in 2018. Here you see the performers acting in this reconstructed work. Um, one of the key factors in the piece is the immersive darkness that one encounters when one first enters the piece, something I think we would also like to go into a bit more detail with um, when Tanya takes the mic in a few minutes. Um, but before we do get onto it, this was clearly a very complex project, and it took an enormous number of people at the museum. I'm not going to thank everybody <laughs> much as I would like to, but in addition to thanking Tanya for her incredible dedication, patience, and perseverance with this project, not least in the difficult times that she had when she herself was incarcerated, right as we were negotiating the acquisition a little over two years ago. But I also wanted to thank our nine performers, without whom this work would not function, would not be available to all of you, and would not have any of the charge that it has. So I'd just like them all to just raise their hand. They're sitting here in the front row. And I'll read out their names. <laughs> I think there's a lot of interest currently in durational performance, and these gentlemen have been really experiencing what it means to be durational, standing there for many hours a day for six weeks. So we would really like to offer my most profound thanks to Ian de Leon, Rudy Gerson, Jonathan Gonzalez, Ernesto Lopez, Kyle Lopez, Mickey Pilarano, Victor Rivera, Alexis Ries Colombera, and Jake Sokolov Gonzalez. Thank you so much. Um, in addition, I wanted to thank the education staff who've really worked hard to make tonight's event happen. Again, it's really an exciting moment to bring these three key figures together, I think, who really form the discourse that um, allows this work to really take the life that it has. So thank you in particular to Pablo Hoguera, Jess Van Nordstrand, Adelia Gregory, Devin Malone, and Mirto Katasamikisha. Thank you to all of you, and also to the core team that worked on the exhibition, Martha Joseph, our curatorial assistant, Lizzie Gorfain, our producer, and Kate Shearer, our assistant producer. Also, a big thanks to our international program and our CMAP program who helped bring Gerardo here to New York, Iberia Perez, Jay Levinson, and Inez Katzenstein, whose first day was today as um, the director of the Cisneros Institute for the Study of Latin American Art uh, and our curator of Latin American Art. Um, and I think that's it for now. I've talked for a long time, and I would really like to hear what our guests have to say. So without further ado, please welcome Gerardo Mosquera. Thank you. Okay, uh, I, want, I want to thank Tania and Stuart Comer for giving me the opportunity to participate in this uh, conversation. Well, uh, you know, one of the many advantages of being old <laughs> is that you have seen many things. <laughs> and that gives you a perspective. So uh, I, I'm, I'll be going back to the past to briefly uh, present three examples of uh, Tania Bruguera's initial uh, work. Which is uh, as important as little uh, known. Generosity is a main component in Tania Bruguera's art. This uh, propensity uh, to give relates to the inclination to pay homage that we also see in her work. As you know, 
contemporary art has not been a favorable space for this. A notable exception is uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, who incorporated generosity as a structural part of his work. One reason why Bruguera titled her piece on exhibition here, quoting Felix's meaningful way of phrasing his work's titles, paying homage to him. On the contrary of what we could think about an artist who has advocated artivism, which is a combination of art and social activism, Bruguera's work often comes out directly from her deep subjectivity, even from an intimate feeling in a sort of symbolic ritualization of experiences and of self-recognition. This is part of a general attempt in her work to unite artistic practice with life. Bruguera's early performance and installations for the fifth Havana Biennial in 1994 addressed the tragedy of Cuban rafters. Thousands of people who have attempted to cross the Straits of Florida over the decades, seeking to arrive to the US. This issue was particularly critical at the time, 1994, uh, due to the terrible situation in Cuba after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. The fifth biennial gathered 200 artists from 43 countries, and a few of them, as Philippine Lani Maestro and Cuban Cacho, also exhibited pieces uh, about both people. Bruguera's work, works were an attempt to take on the experience of the rafter through the symbolic, even identifying with them in the performance Oro of Faith. In Table, uh, in Salvation Board, the artist also pays homage to both people through a refined installation that articulates almost in a tactile way the perceptual and semantic connotations of its materials, black marble, wood, and cotton. This beautiful piece was a memorial to countless Cuban rafters who have disappeared in the sea. It is paradigmatic about the interactions between the political and the aesthetic aspects of art, achieving a synthesis between both, keeping, I would say, I would say that commitment to the aesthetic that Claire Bishop here has point, pointed out in another context. The piece could be even an example of aesthetic activism, a notion that has been recently highlighted by Mark Foster Gage and others. Cuban-born artist Ana Mendieta's entire work was an obsession to uh, embed the silhouette of her body in nature, in a sort of return to the origins by way of uniting image and reality, individu individual representation and cosmos. During the early 1960s, when there was a little exchange between Cuba and the US, Mendieta visited the island frequently rediscovering her own sources in Cuban culture and establishing strong links with the young Cuban artists. She worked and exhibited in Cuba, challenging the political tensions between Cubans at both sides and becoming a symbol of their union. 
Bruguera conceived her series of works tribute to Ana Mendieta in 1985, the year of Mendieta's tragic death. She first completed them in 1992 as her dissertation for her degree at the High Institute of Art in Havana. The exhibition dissertation was shown and discussed that year at the Center for the Development of the Visual Arts in Havana, an art space belonging to the Ministry of Culture. Bruguera recreated some of Mendieta's uh, late installations and other pieces and made other works of which Mendieta only left a drafted project. As if being possessed by Anna, Tania reenacted one of her performances. In 1996, she also reenacted in London the act of creating one of Mendieta's siluetas. She surrounded her, she, she, she surrounded her laying body with fire, which burned one of her legs, an accident that she endured without interrupting the performance. In the early 1990s, Mendieta was not well known among the youngest artists in Cuba. Cuban authorities managed to cover her legacy to a considerable extent, to the point that few people knew about Mendieta's rupestrian sculptures carved in Haruko, near Havana, some of which were destroyed by accident. Actually, these pieces here, this section of the Ropestrian sculptures, it disappears, it's gone now. In this scenario, Bruguera, who never met Mendieta, identified with her to bring her back to the island and to the present, to rematerialize her in order to reposition her in Cuba's collective imagination. She promoted Mendieta's myth through what I see as a semi-religious artistic ritual, indirectly based on the phenomenon of possession, the highest liturgical moment for Afro-Cuban religions, which were a main source for Mendieta's work. We have to be aware that this took place before reenactment became a usual practice. As in Mendieta and in the late Cuban artist Juan Francisco Elso, who was Bruguera's art teacher when she was very young, Bruguera's early work involves a ritualistic approach to art. This was usually related to personal experiences and to her reaction to events taking place in Cuba. I feel that Bruguera's tribute to Mendieta closed the circle of the Cuban American artist work by symbolically solving through a, a vicarious returning of Mendieta to her roots in Cuba, the obsession on which this last base her work. This sort of transubstantiation remains also as a utopia of a possible transterritorial union of the Cuban people. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, to Performance and Media and Education for inviting me here. That was so good, Gerardo. It's so rare to get a discussion of those early works. You've been really privy to something very special there. Um, I'm going to take a different approach, um, which is going to be a little bit more theoretical and less historical. 
Um, some of you may or may not know that Tanya and I have been preparing a book of interviews for most of the last decade. She's hiding her head in shame, rightly so, because this is taking embarrassingly long. Um, but I'm, but uh, we're organising this book of interviews around five chapters which relate to five terms that she uses uh, to describe her art. Now, three of these are in Spanish, Arte de Conducta, Arte Util and Estetica, and were developed in reaction to the perceived inadequacy of Anglophone art critical terms like performance art or social practice. The other two are in English. Gerardo has already just mentioned one, artivism. And the other is political timing specificity. And that's what I'm going to focus on this evening. So uh, I'm going to contextualize Untitled Havana and a few of the works that Tanya has made in Cuba uh, as exemplary of this concept of political timing specificity. And I'm going to give a bit of background to that term because, um, to my knowledge, no one else uh, uses it. So we're, it's a, an exciting moment where we get to theorize something new from scratch. So, uh, oh, I should have had a picture up. And of course, I uh, did not understand, this is what the kind of rigorous art historian I am, I didn't realize this is a reference to Felix Gonzalez Torres, so I, my dating is wrong all the way through this. The parentheses are in the wrong spot. Forgive me. So uh, political timing specificity uh, is, of course, as you would imagine, a rethinking of site specificity. But rather than considering space as an abstract or formal entity, it conceives place and especially time as a conjuncture of circumstances in which to intervene. And I'm going to come back to this term conjuncture, this idea of the conjuncture, which is in political theory. So both site specificity and political timing specificity pay attention to context, but the latter, political timing specificity, plays more, places more emphasis on the contradictions and hypocrisies of a given moment and tries to expose them rather than focusing with the, with a long-term or stable notion of site. And I think if you want to compare over to maybe two classic examples of site specificity, um, you would say uh, one of the er examples of this would be Richard Serra's Tilted Arc in Federal <laughs> Plaza, which of course is a very formal relationship to the site. Look how this Corten steel arc cuts across the, uh, the, 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 the paving of the, of, of the of the plaza and, and sets up this sort of curvaceous dialogue. Um, and another one less known in America, but I think a real uh, important example from Europe is Rebecca Horn's um, installation for Sculpture Projects Munster in 1987, uh, which is staged inside a medieval, uh, a small medieval castle on the outskirts of Munster, which was used for uh, like many, many things, but during World War II it was um, not unlike uh, Morrow uh, in, uh, in Havana, was used as a, as a place for political prisoners and, and saw a, lot, a number of executions executions. And Rebecca Horn, you probably can't see, is like a whole system of little hammers and tapping and eggs and, and things. So, you know, both, so these are different models of site specificity. One is very formal. The other one really deals with the historical resonances of a place. And that's a particular model of site specificity that I think Mion Kwan doesn't deal with in her book, but which we can track a lot of over the last, uh, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years or so, especially in biennials, where people decide to respond to the historical resonance of a, of a given place. So to come back to political timing. So political timing, for Tanya, is the material with which politicians operate. She devised the term after finding that Western critics and curators wanted to focus on the cultural or anthropological dimensions of her practice rather than its specific political dynamics. Western and North American art criticism, she feels, tends to depoliticize works of art and focus on their formal aspects, rather than seeing art as an alternative political device used by those without political power. So Untitled Havana can be seen as a political timing specific work because of the particular conjunction of, sorry, back, let's go backwards, because of the particular conjunction of its production in 2000, a moment when many Americans were visiting Havana and buying up Cuban art, and during the brief window of the biennial when the Cuban government is always keen to present a positive image of the country as more open than it really is. And if you have followed Tanya's work and you're familiar with that, you will know that at each moment when she's been invited to the biennial, she has used prize open that window in order to pull off something that, um, that really um, it makes the government rather unhappy. Um, as for when, for example, she staged Tatlin's Whisper No. 6 during the 2009 biennial. So Tanya has said that Untitled Havana, I quote, worked for the enamored gaze of visitors to Cuba, critiquing their lack of interest in seeing anything other than the media image and the iconic leader, instead of the Cubans who were the real vulnerable ones, end quote. And it's worth remembering that the theme of the biennial in 2000 was one closer to the other. And I think this, uh, uh, th this proximity and vulnerability is very apparent when you see the installation upstairs. 
So, so of course, on one level, you could see this as site specific in that it's uh, you know it's staged in as uh, Harada explained in the in a fortress that has a long history of going from uh, which was I think you explained to me earlier was set up by the British in the 18th century and then uh, was an important um, a place for the imprisonment of political prisoners after the revolution in 59. <laughs> but uh, but it's really what I want to focus on is not so much these resonances of the site which are important but really about what it means to intervene at a particular political moment. So one effect of considering a work to be political timing specific is a reorganization of emphasis away from formal questions and onto political dynamics. Politics, after all, are quintessentially about timing, knowing how to act in a given set of circumstances, or what political theorists have called the conjuncture. And this is a term that's found in a whole um, uh, genealogy of leftist political theory, from Gramsci to Althusser and most recently Hart and Negri. The conjuncture is not just a context or an enumeration of its elements, but their contradictory system. Yeah? So it's a, it's a context, but it's also a contradictory system, one that poses a political problem and which also then points to or indicates a, a historical solution. So the idea of the conjuncture in political theory is underpinned by a much older idea going back to Greek philosophy, that of kairos, a theory of qualitative time that stands in opposition to the quantitative time of chronos, which would be the chronology of the clock or the calendar. Kairos is the right moment, the opportune alignment of circumstances. I'm going to come back to these uh, pictures. But, uh, um, but I think what's important to know is that the idea of Kairos informs Machiavelli and his, uh, his, uh, in, uh, his idea of the occasione in, uh, in his uh, uh, tract, his manifesto of political philosophy, The Prince. Um, and this book is, of course, a bit of a theoretical bombshell because it completely goes against everything, uh, an entire Christian value system. Um, and instead, he offers in, the, in this book, The Prince, he offers a kind of a guide to the dark arts of power for Lorenzo de' Medici. So he puts forward the idea of the occasione or the opportune moment for political action. It denotes for him those rare openings in chronological time when those who are savvy can seize and take hold of power. The prince must be willing to use his virtu, and by that it's not meant virtue so much as virtuosity. As he will use his virtu as necessary, necessity and opportunity dictate. So Machiavelli revolutionizes political philosophy because he encourages moral relativism. Rather than subscribing to a universal code of good and bad, which would be Christianity, he advises that each situation should be taken on an individual basis. Two different and morally opposed actions may both be justifiable depending on the circumstances. Really, the ends determine, justify the means. And I'm just going to come back to these two images because, because they're great. And because Kairos um, is the, the Greek god, um, who's usually depicted as a student, um, is the direct source when it's translated over to the Roman goddess um, Ocasio. And Machiavelli's treatise uh, inspires a whole load of uh, images of Ocasio um, through, through the, 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 the 15th and 16th century. And I just can't help just delight in the iconography here. Not, not being someone who usually deals with iconography, I, I had a real moment when I found out that. Uh, so <laughs> Kairos and Ocasio are always holding uh, scales and a razor. And, the, and they always have, um, sorry, there's always winged, uh, wings on their ankles so they can make a quick escape. And the razor is so that they can, if anyone grabs them by the forelock, they can cut it off and get away quickly. But not just that, they also have, if you notice, the back of their heads are already bald and shaved so that nobody can grab them from behind. <laughs> and I love this image, and I like to think of shaving the back of Tanya's head so that she can make a quick exit, um, so, so that nobody can grab her. OK, so, so Kairos and Occasione are great tools for understanding political timing specificity, because in ancient philosophy, Kairos is not just political, but it's also ethical and aesthetic. And this can be seen in the roots of the word kairos, which are in archery, where it has a dual meaning as an opening or an opportunity and as due measure. Yeah, so it's two things. It's both the opening when something becomes possible and it's knowing, um, you know, kind of an accuracy and the right amount of pressure, like, uh, you know, like Katniss Everdeen over here. Um, but also, isn't this the most kind of renaissance? Like, I mean, isn't, it's, like, it's like Jennifer Lawrence by Botticelli, right? If you just fade the colors out a little bit. So... So Kairos has this dual meaning as an opening or opportunity, but also as due measure, the kind of the right amount of kind of pressure and, uh, you know, in order to pass successfully through the opening. So this triple convergence of the political, the ethical, and the aesthetic, I think, can be seen in several other works by Tanya, including the tribute to Anna Mendieta that Gerardo has just discussed. 
and a work I'd like to focus on more, post-war memory, two newspapers uh, published in Havana in 1993 and 94. So the newspapers were produced during the peak of the so-called special period following Russia's withdrawal of support for Cuba, which led, as Gerardo has also given us a great recap of, leading to food and power shortages so severe that people fled the island on rafts. The state systematically erased the history of those who left. And Bruguera has compared this moment to a traumatic post-war situation. And her new newspapers stand as one of the only documents of this special period outside of tightly controlled official circuits. The newspapers attempted to disrupt the government control of Cuban history by naming all the artists, musicians, and cultural producers who had left the country, thereby keeping the memory of exile alive. And I think, am I right, Tanya? This is the kind of the list here on the, um, on the right-hand side of the list, all the names of, of artists. The newspaper also masqueraded as a catalogue to her first solo show at the Museo Nacional and was immediately seized by the authorities. Bruguera was brought in for questioning and decided then to immediately release the second issue before they could seize them so that its circulation couldn't be halted. And this second issue here fo focused on the history of exile from Cuba, placing the voices of those inside and outside the island on the same page. Now, this doesn't sound like a great deal to us, but this is extremely provocative at that particular moment. And this second time, she was then hauled in for questioning again, but the, to her horror, this was uh, the, the person, the interrogator was her father who was a politician and close to Castro. So the best and perhaps most elaborate example of political timing specificity is perhaps Tanya's attempt to restage her work from the 2009 biennial, Tatlin's Whisper 6, in Plaza de la Revolución in December 2014, in response to the agreement between Raúl Castro and Barack Obama that sought to thaw the diplomatic impasse between the two countries. Although the performance was stopped before it even began, it resulted in a nine-month drama played out between Tanya and the Cuban government, each adopting their respective roles of dissident and oppressor. Each staged their own PR battle. Tanya on social media, with the assistance of her sister and the international art world, and an action during the Havana Biennale, which was a durational reading of Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. The Cuban government, meanwhile, battled inside the country, distributing a video to Cuban art schools that denounced Tanya as a traitor and a troublemaker, removing her from the list of Cuban artists that international arts bodies could come and visit, and subjecting her to re weekly interrogations. They also organized a team of men to noisily repair the street outside her apartment with jackhammers during her reading of Hannah Arendt. And I think I would say the war is continuing. Um, hackers have blocked her email addresses, and the only, only last week they managed to close down her website. As I was trying to find images for this, I texted Tanya, like, why is your website down? And we realized it had been, uh, it was, it had been hacked. So this game or drama with the government underscores the extent to which political timing specificity involves the construction and manipulation of public perception. It's not just about controversy, therefore, such as the NEA4 in, uh, in 1989, or Giuliani taking offense at Chris Ophelia's painting The Holy Virgin Mary at the Brooklyn Museum of Art in 1999, or even Dana Schutz's painting Open Casket at the Whitney Biennial last year. These examples all concern controversy around the reception of a work of art. Instead, political timing specificity, like Kairos and Occasione, concerned the artist's ingenuity for recognizing the right conjuncture, seizing the window of opportunity, and casting an intervention at the moment that will expose a contradiction. Using the media is crucial to this task of changing perception, just as it was for the Cuban Revolution in 1959, for the American election in 2016, and for every politician in every country every day of the week. Political timing-specific art uses these same tools to catalyze a situation in which these same politicians are invited to intervene in return, and which, unbeknownst to them, by doing so, also reveals their true nature and agenda. That's it. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, these were great, very rich presentations. Um, so Tanya will now talk a little bit about um, some of the ideologies behind the piece, and then we'll open it up. Well, um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Stuart, um, Gerardo, and, and Claire to be part of this journey of 30 years. 
figuring things out, uh, making mistakes, and asserting sometimes. And I want to thank all the team at, the, at MoMA. There has been a wonderful experience, to my discomfort. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and thank you for the performers who are the ones making the piece again. Thank you so much. Um, so <clears throat> the, the piece on title Havana 2000 was shown as it was said in the biennial, but I actually conceived the piece while I was studying at the Art Institute of Chicago. I was in, in Chicago, I was coming back, I was doing my MFA, I was coming back to Cuba to participate in the show. I was invited, I submitted several projects, they were all um, uh, discarded, and part of the censorship in Cuba is using aesthetic concept, which I found extremely um, retrograde and, and you know conservative, to say that something is not good enough to be shown so they don't enter into the political discussion. So it's a way to shut people uh, down. So I keep bringing projects, bringing projects. I'm a very patient artist until one day I say stop and I do what I want to do. So that's what happened. So I came, they even say like, oh, there is no sugar cane in Cuba. I'm like, this is the number one you know, industry in Cuba at the time. So I actually hired a guy in a truck and in two hours went to all the places where they were doing guarapo, um, which is the, you know, the, the drink out of uh, sugar cane. And in like maybe two hours, I had like five tons of sugar cane, uh, mild sugar cane. So this is how the piece came. Then a person who worked at the biennial came to censor the piece to see it and then I turn off the light and say, come on, Tanya, I know you. Show the lights. I want to see everything. I know your tricks. And the actual piece was dark. So they didn't understand what I was doing, which helped to make that piece happen because the people were not there yet, and et cetera. So, but basically, the piece was my reaction to all the overexcitement of Americans to go to Cuba in a way in which um, they were not seeing what was happening. They already came out with their storyline even before they actually arrived to the country. Uh, they were going, it was very clear that they were going to have the memories they already constructed before arriving to the island. Um, and that the Cubans were just part of a landscape of ignorance. So I wanted to do this piece for them. Um, a lot of artists, I think, in the year 2000 were surprised by this American invasion. And I actually wanted in purpose to bring the idea, a kind of a reflection of what they were doing. So I actually wanted to use these elements of you go to Cuba to see one thing, the light, which is Fidel, uh, working with this idea of vulnerability um, when you are a person who is in the me using the media to communicate versus the people who actually are in the space. And what happened is the piece, um, Okwe and Wesser came to see the piece. It's a fantastic curator who was doing documenta at the time. I was somewhere depressed with my friends having drinks. And they say, come on, like, Okwe wants to see you. And then I went there. And then he say, OK, Tanya, I want you to do the same but different. And I thank Okwe because he was the person who teach me or who put me an assignment that was extremely hard, which is how can you translate your experience in one place to another place? How can you become an artist from Cuba to keep your political engagement where you engage in other places that don't naturally belong to you? So basically, I created, um, I created a version of the piece which also came out uh, as this idea that I defended for a long time, except this exhibition is not helping that argument, where I say everywhere I go, I'll do the same piece, but um, accommodating it to the situation of the place. So in this case, uh, the piece was for Castle, so I did a lot of research. And for me as an artist, coming, becoming from Cuban to an international quote-unquote artist, um, not going into the trap of the multiculti thing or the, oh, I'm representing this here and being like kind of, uh, 
use as a token and instrumentalize. Um, I decided that I needed to position myself within issues that were of the place that relate to my own personal experience. So I have some level of authenticity of what I was doing. Because what a, right do you have to go to other places to tell all the people what is wrong, right? I think we should do it though. But uh, so basically I did on Title Castle and it was based on the stories when I did the research with the people there. Everybody say we didn't know close by there was a uh, concentration camp. We didn't know people were burn a few blocks from here. So I wanted to address the issue of what is the complicity we have on our historical moment. How can you, how easy it is when things has passed 30, 40 years later to be all together um, agreeing in what is right and what is wrong, but how difficult it is to in the moment understand what is right and what is wrong and what is your role on the right and the wrong. So it was about that. It was, uh, f physically speaking, it was uh, the opposite of the other is too much light because I felt like the history of uh, Germany was so much talked about that sometimes we couldn't see. Um, so also it continued this idea of, um, I'm a visual artist, but I try to problematize the visualization of things. I try to be, uh, I, I am not comfortable with images, so I wanted to make the image difficult to enter. So in this case, there was a moment where you had the sound of people walking and cocking a gun, and then if you were in the right spot, you see it's not a recording, but a real person. And that was actually the moment where people got very, like, this is for real, right? Somebody with a gun. Then I did a piece from Moscow, and in this case, I was concentrating in the idea of, um, like, the KGB is one thing that is related to Cuba. And, uh, <laughs> And then I decided to use this idea of the spectacle, how you can trick people into looking at something while something else is happening, something many politicians do. So in this case, you had these beautiful performers <laughs> for the piece, and people enter and they were very excited to play with these animals, and then they were taking a family portrait. They discover once you give them right away their photo that in that portrait is the creator of the KGB. So it's part of the family. <laughs> um, another piece I did was in Bogota. And uh, this piece for me was, I mean, all of the series is about the political imaginaries that we create. Um, and in this case, um, back then we used to say Colombia. Unfortunately, the thing many people relate to is the drug, although now Netflix is not helping. With all these, like, uh, you know, El Chapo and all these things, uh, you know, um, things about drug and Latin America. But, um, but in this case, I wanted to address actually a question. People say Che Guevara is a hero and his guerrilla was amazing. But what happened with all the guerrilla? What happened with all the pl places, like, for example, the FARC and so on? And I wanted to understand what the hero means for people. So basically, I invited uh, a desplazado, a leader of desplazado, which is a uh, national program they had in Colombia at the time to bring people from the war zones into the city, but they were never integrated. So it was very, you know, abandoned people, basically, with a lot of troubles, uh, social uh, inaccess, and so on. The, the family of somebody who was missing and uh, a FARC um, uh, person. It's part of the fact. And they were talking about what is a being a hero. People were very tired. We're like, what the hell is this? Like, again, the same old, same old. And then all of a sudden, this woman um, came out with a trade out of cocaine. And as you can see, people were actually using the cocaine. We came out of with five trade. Each trade had 20 um, lines. And um, unfortunately, um, I mean, at some point I say let's stop because the energy is uh, high enough, uh, symbolically speaking. 
But, um, and then for me, what really happened was not what was in the scene, but what happened after, which is all the discussion it generated about what right an artist has to talk about another context, what right an artist has to talk about sensitive, senti sensitive things for us. And also it helped me to understand that my work is not what you see and what you experience, but it's only the staging of a problem that you have to solve yourself. Thanks. So maybe just to dive in, <clears throat> um, again, to reiterate, reiterate what has been suggested, when this piece was presented, I remember that uh, <clears throat> Bush had been elected roughly two weeks prior to the opening of the biennial. So it opened with Clinton still in office, and he had radically opened up relations to Cuba, which is what allowed so many Americans to visit at that particular time. Um, and then it was just under a year before 9-11, when, of course, things changed fundamentally. So now, <clears throat> 18 years later, um, we're in a different transition of power. Um, and I guess this is a question partly in terms of how, what is the role of the museum in terms of framing these narratives, these historical narratives? Because some of this work might function better as documentation. Some of the work, um, and at least in this case, we have attempted to reconstruct or restage. Um, and I'm very, um, and I find Clara's argument very compelling about political timing specificity, but then one of the big problems for performance in the museum context is how do you deal with the space of history and the space of the archive, and when is it appropriate to make that live again and to somehow revive or recuperate something? So, in particular, I think, you know, for instance, if you take Marianne Amache, who is a composer whose works were intensely site-specific, and so there's a group of young composers now trying to grapple with the problem of how do we restage her work when, you know, those sites often no longer exist. In this case, obviously, we're in a very different uh, sociopolitical condition um, than what was happening in Havana in 2000. You know, is it appropriate to restage it in this context, and what is produced, um, and how does the passage of time impact political timing specificity? I think the fascination of the American for Cuba is still there. A fascination that is irrational, that is blind, and that doesn't allow us to have a complex dialogue about our reality with others. So I think in that sense, I feel the same kind of conditions are still in, because it's the kind of same um, viewer, let's say, quote to quote, who will approach it in a way. Um, but I think in terms of restaging or redoing uh, works, I feel that we, the museums and the artists, should be also responsible of preparing the audience for it. And that's something we work a lot on here. Um, this is why when you enter, there is this big text that you can read something about the context, but also you can read the the you know, the interviews with the brochure. So I almost feel that it is as important to prepare the audience because we rely too much on aesthetics and the idea that aesthetics are um, categories that do not, in a mob, uh, don't move and don't change. And uh, the fact that something was amazing in 1965 doesn't mean that now will be having the same reaction. Or we. So I advocate for two things, either a very historical re redoing of a piece where you have to explain what was the sensibility of the moment or an update of the place, play. play. No, I think Tanya's completely right. It's, you know, it's obviously very difficult, you know, very different if an artist decides to reactivate a work and that is, is political timing specific, as you did with Tatlin's Whisper Six, when you, you decide now is the moment when this will actually have more traction and this is the moment where this work is needed versus a museum deciding that something is timely because it's usually tied up in a whole lot of other considerations about, well, this artist hasn't been shown here for a very long time. Maybe we should show them. Um, this will be the kind of the, the first display of their work, it's like, you know, all that kind of, you know, press uh, bullshit that goes around with um, deciding, you know, programming and timeliness and, you know, something, some kind of spurious connection is made, but it's usually not the same kind of um, intensity of commitment as when an artist decides that a piece needs 
re reactivating. Um, for I mean, I can't help giving because uh, I'm sitting in MoMA, uh, uh, one of Stuart's colleagues at PS1, um, the, the the very senior figure there, not Biesenbach, but the other one, um, said to me once, "I think I'd like to restage." When it was this was before he was working at PS1, I would like to restage Gracia Cala, Graciela Carnavale's. Um, uh, intervention from the experiments of uh, the cycle of experimental art in Rosario in 1968. And this is a work that is so context specific, it's so political timing specific in its, uh, if you know this work, this is where she invited people to a gallery opening, locked them inside, and then they, uh, they were just left inside until, uh, you know, in fact, none of them decided to break the glass and get out. And it was an external intervention that finally liberated them from the gallery space. And he wanted to redo it in Minneapolis. And I thought, why on earth would you want to restage a work that is, that is so uh, so completely bound up to the context of the dictatorship and uh, people's sense of physical and psychic oppression at that moment in Minneapolis. Uh, so, uh, I'm <laughs> so I think we have to be very careful the, uh, the, 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 the how, so it's maybe it's about how, not that it's automatically bad to restage things because I'm definitely against the, the, the fetish of the original and it never being, uh, the public never being allowed to access that, but but the but there need to be really good reasons, I think, for for restaging something. So I'm curious to hear more about why you think, that, like now, um, you know, how the how the work reads now after after it, at this at another moment of difficult, or, well, on the horizon, potentially difficult diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Cuba. Well, I think and for. Uh, so no, I feel that right. I, I mean, when we start talking about the peace, um, the situation was very different. Um, now I feel that more than relation between Cuba and United States, for me, what because the other thing is when we see the work again, there are always other aspects that can come to the forefront. It doesn't have to be exactly the one that was originally. Uh, important because pieces have different issues. So in this case, I feel that the issue that is more current right now is the fact that people have left to quote unquote strong politicians the faith of a country, and this is something happening in the United States right now. And I feel that um, I don't want to be criticized by this comparison, but it's a longer conversation. But the fact that there is a precedent all the time on TV, every time you put the, the channel on, reminds me of the omnipresence of Fidel, that every time and everything was around him. And, um, and for me, the danger is, this is beyond the policies, beyond the ideas about society, it's just this fact. The problem is when this person uh, um, is so present that it's invisible again, so they have more power. And this is what I'm afraid of. So I felt actually, some people came and they say, Jesus, I am so afraid. And I say to them, yes, wait three or four more years of Trump. <laughs> so then you will see exactly, you know. But again, I mean, I want to ask Carlo a question in a second, but just to quickly follow up on, on this line of thinking, I guess, this work, as much as we've made every effort to rethink how it could be documented, given that it is in total darkness, and so the original documentation from 2000 was overlid and actually a little bit misleading, and so we really tried to think this through. Um, but I don't think any photograph or any kind of documentary um, approach to the work really provides the charge that one encounters in the space. And so that was in part, I guess, my rationale for really wanting to recreate it. And I have to say, the first moment in a rehearsal when the performers occupied the space, you know, I had a chill that just went up my spine, you know, exactly as it had in Havana. And so, in a sense, it worked. And so, I can't say that this is obviously the encounter every single visitor has. Um, but we really have tried to, you know, create um, an occasion, you know, and one in which you can actually have that physical, phenomenological encounter with the work and not only understand it archivally. But I guess I would also, Gerardo, love it if you could just maybe talk a little bit about um, that moment in 2000, and especially I remember in particular um, Jote Medina, a curator from Mexico City, reading a manifesto in your defense specifically. And 
Um, and then I remember having coffee in your garden and you know you were kind of outlining the cultural and political situation in that moment but it was very clear that you were under constant surveillance by the government and it was a very troubling time for you um, and somehow I just find this piece at least for me really synthesizes a lot of those concerns problems and um, just this constant sense of, of surveillance uh, and fragility and vulnerability. So maybe you could talk a bit about um, how that year, the biennial, compared to previous years, and what, what was at stake? Well, actually, I, I don't think that uh, regarding uh, the way in which the government treats me, there was a difference, you know, that in the year 2000 or in this year. Since I resigned back in 1989 uh, to my position at the, Havana, at the Wilfredo Lamb Center, which organizes the Havana Biennials, I've been totally marginalized from uh, Cuba's institutional life. That means I can't teach, I can't curate an exhibition, I can't publish, I don't even participate at the panel discussion in my own country. Uh, I, ha I haven't been given like uh, this uh, email uh, facility services that uh, uh, is given to artists and writers, uh, uh, you know, up to now. So I, I think I have been like uh, under uh, constant pressure. And I don't know why, I mean, because, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I, I do know why because of my uh, critical uh, position uh, regarding the political situation in Cuba. But I think that they, in a way, I think I, uh, they don't like me, for also for other reasons, because it has been like kind of too much. Because I, I'm, I'm not the only critical person in, in, in Cuba. I, I was reading Leonardo Padura's great novel, uh, uh, The Man Who Loved uh, Dogs you know, which is about Trotsky and Trotsky's assassination. But actually the novel is an overwhelming deconstruction of uh, the socialist utopia. I mean, it's really tremendous. And I think, what well, about Padura is living, uh, the writer is living in Cuba and he's more or less okay. He's not, I mean, the books are not allowed in Cuba, but uh, you know, so I, uh, I don't know why this uh, 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 obstination, uh, you know, regarding myself. Uh, I think that what happened, uh, Tanya, with uh, this work, I mean, this fast censorship that it suffered, was, I think, because of the Fidel Castro's presence on the uh, monitor. And which uh, I, 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 I was uh, telling you something about that. I, I would like to mention that here because it's a, a kind of a contextual aspect that if you enter the uh, installation here, the, the work, well, you will look at the TV as a monitor. It's a monitor which is part of an installation and a performance. But when I look at that, I look at the, uh, I look at that as a, a TV set, in the sense that uh, Castro has been always present in uh, Cuban living rooms, uh, you know, because of his permanent uh, uh, appearance, uh, you know, at the, on TV, because uh, he used he, he was using TV to rule the country since 1959. He was ahead uh, of his time, you know, even before the, the Nixon-Kennedy uh, uh, debate in which TV became here like an important uh, uh, factor for, the, for politics, he was using TV constantly, you know. Uh, so the TV monitor was also like a sort of monument if you go to Cuba, you won't find any bronze statue of Castro or any of these uh, leaders because the actual the statue was the TV set and its permanent presence uh, there. Simon, 
remember also the same week there was an attempt on his life. And um, I remember, I think it was one of the last days we were there, and there were groups of school children in a lot of public plazas, you know, with their arms raised, sort of saying, Hail Fidel, effectively. And it was, in contrast to your work, a little intense. <laughs> and it was quite something. Um, Claire, do you have do another have question? Okay. Um, I mean, again, I just I would like to dig a little bit deeper. Um, maybe one last question before we open it up to the audience into this idea of political timing specificity, because I think it's a really important idea, and it really does shift the conversation away from site specificity. They're related, but um, you know, particularly a media event. And I think if you think about Latin American performance in particular, or you know, Marta Minujín or Graciela Carnavale, I mean, I think you're absolutely right to say some of these works really were about. Um, they were about the media image or uh, kind of exploiting the media and its coverage of a certain event. Um, but again, I don't think necessarily they lend themselves well to being restaged now. And one of the things Tanya and I have talked a lot about is the fact that this is actually, ironically, the least Instagram-friendly artwork you can imagine. So at the moment, you know, when ideally we, this would be circulating mm. globally all over Instagram, you can't because we won't allow cameras in the space and it's too dark anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of an implicit irony there. But that also, I think, holds a certain appeal because it does, it slows you down mm -hmm. and it makes you have to think and not just constantly snap things. Um, but I guess I get the question again when none of us is here anymore and it's no longer up to Tanya to decide when this work could be shown. You know, what are some of the ethics or criteria that might determine that? Sorry, Tanya. Let's revisit the contract. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I do think of this work. It's funny you pr frame it as performance because although there are four performers in it, I really think of it as installation. And it's starting a whole series of installations that you do that are animated by, um, by, by performers. But then it's not in the sense of delegated performance that I discuss in a chapter of Artificial Hells, where people are being hired by an artist to represent a particular social group. This is not what's going on here. Although Momo have said that the the performers are of Cuban descent. This is not the most important thing about them. The way Tanya has employed people in the castle installation and this installation is much more on the model of, of, of theatre, yeah? where you're hiring people to perform particular movements and care. It's choreographed. It's not, you're not exposing people um, for their particular um, identity. For example, you know, when Santiago Sierra makes a work in, 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 in Espacio Glutinador a year before you make this, where he gets um, a number of prostitutes who are addicted to heroin, had tattoos a line across their back, and they are then paid in shots of heroin, right? This is very clear. These are women, these are prostitutes, these are, they have a relationship to a drug problem, right? So they're being exhibited for that particular idea. You never do that. It's a very neutral kind of um, position that you, that you uh, have with your, with your performers here. Um, and if they're, uh, and so the work has, I think, has not been subject to the same kind of ethical complaints and criticisms that a lot of works, such as Sierra, um, have been, or Arta Zimievsky, or any number of other artists producing work through the late 90s and 2000s. That they, it, it, your work hasn't received that kind of criticism because it's it's fundamentally not that kind of work. I think you know you're hiring people, but it's um, but it's the the installation in which it's it's housed is is as important, if not more important, whether it's the lights and the castle installation or the, or the sugar cane here. And the incredibly, sorry, I keep looking over here because we've got a little monitor so I can look at the picture and think about it rather than craning my neck. Um, but I realize I'm not looking at you. Um, uh, you know, the spell is unbelievably pungent and it's the kind of the texture, the slippiness of the sugar cane under your feet, the darkness as your eyes adjust to it. It's a whole phenomenological experience. It's a, it's a genre of installation um, in which there happens to be, and you gradually become aware of, performers brushing their bodies and making movements. Um, where am I going with this? I think it's to bounce an institutional question back to you, Stuart, which is about the, um, how slow inst and how difficult it is for institutions to acquire this kind of work. And you know, it's taken, this is a major, major piece by Tanya. It's taken 18 years for any in institution to show any shred of interest in acquiring it. And I guess I want to ask you, what happens to this work when you deinstall it? Because that's also tied up with the question of when you reinstall it. Yeah? Uh, is everything just you know, pulverized and, and destroyed? Or is, or is everything carefully, carefully kept? Including, I was, I was, if you could tell us about the smell again, I would be really happy to hear about that. There's a special story about the smell. Oh, sorry. I'm being censored here by a Cuban <laughs> artist. 
No, we can say, we can say. I would just say quickly. I mean, I would, I would slightly disagree about um, the neutrality of the performers in the sense, I mean, we've had many discussions with them. There's a debrief after every single day. Um, at least two of you had relatives who were tortured or killed in similar prisons. And so I think a lot but of you are- That wasn't hiring criteria. You weren't seeking you weren't seeking Cubans whose relatives have been No no not at all but we were but it was a criteria that's a, that's a of fortuitous Tanya's, but it's a fortuitous coincidence Right but I still think at this moment in time a lot of Cubans are still working through these histories in very personal ways and I think that probably arguably could lend the work a charge um, because I don't think you know a body even if it's going through fairly repetitive task based movements doesn't you know it has an aura it does have a charge and I think that's partly what one feels in the space, um, you know, we can do But as, that. as you would with, uh, with, uh, with actors, and uh, 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 I, I mean, I, as if there is such a thing as a neutral body, but uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, and I think it's great that you've done that here because it's really grounded a piece that could have been, you know, helicoptered or, you know, parachuted into New York. It's really given it uh, um, a different texture and it's shown a commitment on the behalf of the, behalf of the institution to kind of re rethinking, you know, who and why the performers are here. Um, but it's not a crucial, it's not as crucial to the work who the performers are as, for example, the sugar cane I, or the I, darkness. I don't agree. Why? Because I think actually I gave them a lot of headaches because for me it was so important that they were Cubans or from Cuban descent. Because I feel that in my work, part of the material, and sorry guys, but part of the material of the work is the history that you carry with you. The political history, the economic history, the social history, the gender history that you carry with you. and. Uh, yes, it was for Twitter that two people had family members who had a similar uh, experience of the one shown in the work, but it's not for Twitter because I don't know the exact number, but probably, I don't know, seven out of ten people have that experience in Cuba. Like, there are so many people in Cuba who had been in trouble for saying the wrong question, for, you know, so many people have been uh, in their family, have a member who has been in prison or have been like casti uh, castigado, like punished for something inappropriate politically or something. That That's not, uh, but, you know. But when you first made the piece, that was not on your mind because you couldn't have hired anyone but Cubans. No, but it is, no, but it was, in purpose that there were Cubans who were my neighbors, who were people nobody will see at the biennial. Okay. You know, they would pass through my house to, they knock at my door, they wanted to come and see the artists and the artwork the artists do. They would not see the guy that is sitting next to that door. Right. And those were the people I hired to do the piece. They were people, literally my neighbors, okay. you know. So, so it has a content. Like, I don't, and this is actually good that you talk about this because I feel there is a trend in redoing performances we, we, when we strip down things of their original meaning. Mm. And that's extremely dangerous because this is kind of uh, aestheticization of everything, where we are obliged to be in awe just because it's aesthetics. And I want to be in awe because their political impact. So. But it's interesting, you just made me think of something I hadn't really thought about, which is again, in this case, it's the invisibility of visibility somehow. Or, you know, I mean, a number of artists have tried to highlight invisible labor, like Alan Sekula, or, but I'm actually thinking of this piece now in relation to the Bushra Khalili installation that we showed two years ago in the atrium, in which for several years she documented uh, refugees um, who were kind of crossing uh, the Mediterranean basin uh, to escape sites of conflict and she refuses to show their face she only shows their hand and for her there are a lot of ethical questions tied up in the way the media does sensationalize images of refugees and so there is something about this piece that it takes this gigantic media image of Castro and it shrinks it down and makes you have to look for it at the end of the tunnel and then kind of you know, it's a very intimate experience and then similarly with the performers you don't really see their face you don't see them as you know, that you see them as a shadow. And so it's, it's an interesting question about how visibility functions in this work, because you are trying to expose a question on a problem, um, but then you activate more than just your eyes. 
And uh, the longer you stay there and the longer your eyes adjust, you realize that the four performers are, are doing different things with their bodies. Could you tell me about the choreography of these four um, sets of movements? Because I couldn't work it out when I was staying there. No. So basically, when I did the piece, I was still trying to figure out presentation, representation issues, and symbolism versus hyper-reality um, issues. But in here, um, there were four gestures that kind of, I thought, reflected some of the anxieties of Cubans um, and some of the mechanical uh, commitment of Cubans um, to the reality. So in this case, one is uh, a person that bows in a, in a way that is, uh, you know, submissive in a way. But if you are able to see it properly, you can see that the performers keeps looking at you when they are going down. So it's a little more intense because it's almost like, yeah, I know I have to submit to you, but I'm really not for it. You know, so it's something that happens many times in Cuba. So the other gesture is about um, trying to either find something in your mouth or take something out of your mouth or, or stop your mouth out of being, uh, you know, bringing something out of it. So in that case, of course, I mean, I don't want to literally size all the gestures, um, but it, it talks about this idea of self-censorship and how so many people in Cuba uh, decide to um, shut up it's, and how that shutting up over time becomes um, a burden and how it actually becomes double moral and how it becomes the country we have today. Um, the other gesture is uh, brushing out something of the body, which I really like because you can have sound in the piece as well. Uh, and it's this kind of obsessive thing where you have nothing, but the person is thinking, it's my fault, it's my guilt, it's, you know, I need to you know, take something out of me. And the last gesture, actually, we changed it for here because I didn't like the original one so much. So in a session that we had with the performers where we were doing exercises and trying something, somebody, uh, uh, I think it was Mickey, probably. You guys remember who it was? It was Ian. Oh, sorry, Ian. So it was Ian who, by trying to do something with his mouth, he did this gesture. And I immediately said, like, stop, this is great. Because it actually reminded me so quickly on when a police stop you, the gesture you have to do. Um, and then we did this and this, kind of like, you know. Um, so that's a, a adding uh, in a group. What did you uh, it, it replaced one that is not so good, so what to talk about it. <laughs> uh, uh, Tanya, but uh, something that to me is uh, very interesting about this piece is that it's quite open. I mean, you know, a problem that you find in, in much uh, uh, so-called political art mm -hmm. is that perhaps it's too literal. You know, it's, going, it's direct. But here, you know, you really manage uh, to to create like uh, a, a, a whole experience that goes beyond that, you know, and and it's open and and you you get to your own uh, ideas. You you I I think that every visitor will experience the work in a different way, and I think that that's also one reason for have the work here, because it's not so contextually tight the work. Of course, it responds to a particular uh, context, but it goes far beyond. It's, 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 it's more about an, an experience dif difficult to describe, about control, about power, about the feeling in a, a vulnerable uh, situation. And I think that that's one more reason why this work in particular is so important in your uh, career. No, I agree, but very quickly, I know we have to open to the floor, but um, it is true, but at the same time, I feel like the Cubans who have come to see the peace, the Venezuelans who have come to see the peace, and some Russians who have come to see the peace have a very different experience. Some of them in a very deep 
emotional manner that maybe for others is just some landscape far away, you know, so. No, but what, what I was saying is, is not that it's not received as, 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 as the, the political as a, a piece uh, 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 introducing a political message, but this message is uh, broader, it's open. And then last thing, because I really do want to give you all a chance to ask questions. Um, it, it goes back a little, I mean, Clara, at some point I really do want to talk to you more about the, the reading through Machiavelli, because I think it's very interesting. But one of the performers had also mentioned Pasolini and Salo, and, you, you know, you, and then we talked a lot about Plato's cave or Michelangelo's slaves. You know, there are so many moments throughout history in which ideas that circulate in this piece and in a different way for every viewer. But I, I, you know, again, I, this is what for me gives the piece such a timeless quality. Um, so, on to all of you. Um, if you could all speak into the microphone and just wait patiently for it to ensure that everyone can hear you and we are recording. So our friends out in cyberspace will want to hear your questions as well. We have one just here in the front, please. The mic's on its way. Okay. We had two in the front. Um, hi, I'm Ernesto Mujica. I'm a clinical psychologist, psychoanalyst, and I was actually born right up in the cabana near the Fortaleza. Um, it was almost initially almost impossible for me to walk into the piece because this, for me, this is a, an internal space of terror. Um, but uh, it was also very helpful to be able to go into it and stay for a while. And then I noticed the beauty, and I remembered the beauty of the sugar cane um, in the fields in Guanabacoa, on the outskirts of the center of the city. Um, but the, the piece is also, I agree very much with what's been said about it being transcendent. Uh, it reminded me of the slave ships. And I, I, it, it was, for me, also an homage to slavery um, and to, to what is left after um, enslavement. These are the memories. It tied me also to Kara Walker's work because of the silhouette of the pieces. I mean, this silhouette on the right could have come right out of you know, one of her pieces. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And there's another question here in the front row. If you could just pass the mic down, that would be great. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you want to say something no, too? No, okay. Yeah. No, you go first. Well, I hear my voice all the time. <laughs> but I have. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, just to dis full disclosure, I'm one of the performers. My name is Rudy Gerson, and um, I did want to bring back uh, the discussion of the performers um, being just another material in the piece, akin to the sugar cane, akin to the wall, akin to the video. Um, and the, un the unenclosability when we try to talk about this piece and w how to make meaning from it, um, and that it's actually infinite what people experience in there. And so when we talk about it um, as performers, as curators, as audience members, um, we can only speak about the ambition of the piece and the staging of the piece. Because um, I'll say, as, as a performer in there, there are people who get very, very close to each performer to see each gesture. And there are people who um, encounter the bodies in the space. And I think if we encounter the bodies in the space in a similar way that we encounter the sugar cane, in a similar way that we encounter the wall, um, we fall into the, the, the trap and reveal our own politics about how we treat uh, oppressed bodies. And so to contemporize the piece is to think about how we treat the bodies differently than these materials, whether we don't treat them at all and stay within the center safety of the light or whether we're willing to go close in the darkness and, and actually encounter them as vulnerable, full people. And so I don't have a question, but I did need to say that um, as one of the performers that it's, uh, it's profound when people either encounter us as just part of the aesthetic landscape and when they encounter us 
as uh, bodies stuck in this uh, artificial hell. <laughs> well, can I respond quickly? I mean, I would really not want you to go away with the idea that I thought of your bodies as equal to the other components of the installation. And you're speaking on a very pragmatic level of how people come into the space and react to you. And of course, your bodies have an incredible charge and a frisson and, and do something um, in terms of our uh, interaction with the piece that, that cannot be accomplished by, by mere material. I'm not a new materialist who sees uh, all matter as, as equal and vi equally vital. Some are definitely more vital than others. Um, I was trying to make a, a distinction um, on the level of semantics and signification within the piece and about whether um, the performers are um, as, as redolent with meaning as, as individuals, as, as some of the other components of the work. Because there has been a tradition of performance over the last 20 years or so, which is really actually the opposite of this. It's really about objectification. Yeah? Under bright light, in a harsh white gallery space, nothing, just exhibiting people. And, and this is, you know, you, you are exhibited, of course, but it's, it's much more subtle and it's not done with the same um, brutality as some of these uh, other works that have been done over the last 20 years, which I've referred to as delegated voice, which, I, and, I, and a crucial part, a strand of that work has been exhibiting people for a particular, for their particular social demographic. So, anyway. Susana Torreya Laval. The US has always consumed Cuba. Its stance towards the island, its people, its products, its culture is one of consumer. Do you see any hope in turning that around, in making the Cuban people visible to the US that goes there to consume it? And where would that hope come from? Well, I think um, is up to Cubans to do what is best for Cuba. And I think um, once the American understand they should be somebody accompanying us and not somebody telling us what to do, some people who can be there as a reference, like other people, Europeans or other Latin Americans, the problem is when the Americans want to be the rulers, when they want to export democracy when they don't let people have their own way of ruling themselves. For me, this is a problem they have not solved in the United States. And I personally, as critical as I am of the Cuban government, which I continue and I will continue to be, I will be as critical more of people in the United States trying to do that to Cuba. Back of the room for a moment. Just go dead center. Um, and then, yeah, is there a, oh, and then, then after, why don't you go ahead, sir, in the okay. far back, and then we'll go to Thomas in the middle. I, I just had a question for Tanya about um, I, your thoughts in making a piece similar to this that is not this piece as you've done in other locations, like in Castle and Moscow. Um, because I'd really prefer not to wait three years before you do something like this that is reflective of the American society and our current state of being. Can you repeat the beginning? I couldn't hear you. Again. Do you have any plans for restaging this in a way that is not the uh, yes. reenactment? Um, I, it took me a while to react to the situation here, in part because I, um, I mean, I was very, I've been very active and very vocal about what I think about what's happening in the United States right now. And, but as an artist, I think it's important, the way I work, is not to be reactive, but to be um, constructive. So it has taken me a little bit of time to figure it out how to do a piece about the situation in the United States today. Um, that is not saying the obvious, that is not bringing people apart, but try to bring people together. And I am working on one that very soon will be shown. So I will let you know. In the meantime, we put some uh, ads in the New York Times, thank you, Mama, uh, that say dignity has no nationality. I think that he got it, the orange man got it. <laughs> and if he read, I don't think he reads actually, but. <laughs> 
Um, and now there is a project together with the city um, and Watermill and some partners where few artists have been invited to do big billboards in the city uh, addressing the situation. You will see some of those with text. Uh, but I'm preparing an actual piece about what is happening. Um, so the, the fact that the work was immediately censored by the Cuban government suggests that it's a kind of um, unilateral critique of Castro, but at the same time, the kind of submission that the performers so beautifully embody and make palpable in the viewer's body suggests a kind of adoration or veneration of Castro as well. And I guess I'm curious within that, that duality of veneration and adoration on the one hand and critique on the other hand for this idol, um, if you can talk about that symbolically and in, in how that um, gives on to kind of ambivalence around the status of socialism globally um, in, well, in this piece, uh, well, in the materiality of this piece. Yeah, I think this is great um, also. I mean, the Cuban government is so afraid of its own people that could not handle nuances, could not handle subtleties, could not handle critique. Uh, could not handle doubts, you know. So um, anything that is not completely declaratory in a way that is understood by them, aesthetically speaking as well, as politically speaking, because you can do something in favor of Fidel, but if they don't get the aesthetic of that, if it's a punk performance, they'll be suspicious just because of the form. Uh, just be Marxist, the form and the content, the same thing, right? So, so I think that's one thing. The other thing is my position as an artist, not my position as a citizen, but as an artist, is like art should not be a pamfleto. I should not be a propaganda piece. It should be an opening into yourself. And it is a moment in which you confront yourself about certain situation, either political, emotional, whatever, you know, identity. So, so in this case, I feel that I don't try to tell people what is right or what is wrong, but they don't like that either. They don't even allow the questioning, you know. So I think that's one way. The other thing is the characters, and I, we talk about this a lot with the performers, that there is some sort of transition in the meaning of the figures. For me, as an artist at the beginning, they were like Atlantes, like the people who sustain the buildings, um, this invisible building that is the power in Cuba. Um, then they transform itself into this kind of a slave figures, and they end up for me as this kind of like um, uh, broken machines, you know. So I think that's for me the the kind of narrative of that. Uh, out of for global socialism, that's I don't I'm equipped I'm not equipped to to discuss that right now here. <laughs> Stay tuned. All right, just here. Yeah, there's one in the back. Can you come down to this? Remember? Thank you. Yes, it's alto montadas also. Yes, it's alto. Oh, sorry. Alto montadas. Hi, um, the three of us were, you know, of Cuban descent. All of our parents are Cuban. Um, one of the questions I have for you as an artist and sort of moving about the world is. Uh, surveillance, right? So I met one of my friends, Cuban friends, cousins in Spain, and in Spain, not in Cuba. And I asked him, "What's the situation in Cuba?" And he looked at me, and he just didn't say anything. And he kind of nodded, like, "Don't ask me because I'm being watched." And this was all the way in Spain, right? So I'm wondering, you as an artist, that you're very vocal and you're very like out there. Do you worry about constant surveillance, even when you're not? in the country or even with the <laughs> current administration. Now, you know, like, how do you deal with that yeah. stress and the, uh, I guess, I, the whole I, thing? I feel that you can say something too, but I feel that one of the biggest damage of the Cuban revolution, even when they had great program and great social ideas and so on, was that they damaged people from the inside. They have damaged the fiber of the citizen. And part of that is that you can, I mean, you were telling that my father was part of the people who interrogated me in 2000, in 1994. 
that is something I had to bring with me for 20 years until one day I was able to talk about it. So the fact that anybody can be, um, you know, a police ends up by you being policing yourself. And that's for me the biggest damage that we have to restore. How can you take out of the police you, you have inside, you know, yourself, the one they have put on you? But um, yeah, it's not paranoia. If, I have a friend who say it's not paranoia if it really happens. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, in the recent years, uh, it's been debated a lot about uh, site-specific works. Um, a little bit about contextualize the works and context changing, but very little has been discussing about time specificity. Considering that work it was made in 2000, you think the possibility that this work go back to Cuba, be showing there, things have been changing, but I think it will be Mm -hmm. interesting to see mm -hmm. then which kind of reaction you have in that situation. Mm. And I think as a second part, if that work is possible to be there, how you feel to be presented under the MoMA collection? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, few, few issues. I feel that um, First of all, on, on, on the issue of time, I feel, political time, I feel that in my work, I do work, I, would, I do art when it's necessary. It's not just because, oh, I want to talk about this issue. So I feel like some sort of response to the political sensibility. Uh, in terms of com going back to Cuba and show the piece, I would love that very much. Right now, I am not allowed, as you personally know, to go inside Cuban art institutions. Um, being right now, the Cuban government has stopped three of my shows outside, outside of Cuba. So the Cuban government is intervening not only in my artistic life in Cuba, but also has worked outside of Cuba to stop potential um, you know, art opportunities and career opportunities. And when I say that, it's not about me. This is a policy that is established since 1961 that has been the one that Felix Gonzalez Torre, the one that Reina Darena, the one that like Gabriel Infante, the one like everybody has been dealing with. The fact that even outside of Cuba, the tentacles are so long, they, they can convince people to please don't work with her. She's great, but. And after the bat, they envenenate, envenen them to, to Alma. No? They, uh, they poison your, your soul about the person who takes so much thought. So I will love to put that piece again in Cuba. Right now, I will even, you know, you know, uh, you know work very hard for that if I could do it. And actually, I'm going to take the challenge and I'm going to go to the, to the I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to to the um, to the um, Centro of Lang and ask them, or the Museo Nacional, and ask them if they want to do this piece again. And I will promise to record it and to share it online. The answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in terms of what has changed, what has changed is their approach to sell themselves. But the policies are not still in there. Right now, Fidel, his last wish was not to be made a statue or a monument about him. So unanimously, the Cuban government, the Asamblea Nacional, uh, decided to make a law in which you don't uh, do any monument about Fidel. The only exceptions, you cannot use his name in any school, any, anything. Uh, the only exception is the Center for the Study of the Work of Fidel. Um, second exception is the photos, because they don't consider that a monument. And the third exception is artists who will celebrate the leader. <laughs> the interesting part of that is that there is another law in place since 40 years, que se llama desacato, which means that if you say something about the leader in your artwork or any expression form, verbally or otherwise, you can get in jail. So it's an interesting, I would love to test that actually. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you for the idea.
All right, I think we have time for one final question. Just over here, please. I don't know why I lunged for it. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you about the journey and also the performers, the journey that you guys had together in putting this piece, um, working on this piece at MoMA. All right. Um, I just want to share something here very special for the first time. I remember you inside the piece. This is something that I'm doing for the first time and that we are doing for the first time. I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, what's your name? Kaylin. Kaylin, nice to meet you, Ernesto. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, <coughs> and I want to ask you, why make you ask us this question? Because it's amazing. Um, well, well, I'm I'm a performer myself. Okay. I'm an actor, and I um, am really interested in this kind of performance art. And I it scares me, and I don't know much about I I know about it, but um, I'm I need to educate myself more on it. Um, but it's something that I really would love to to do myself and venture into. So I would just love I admire this piece so much and it really moved me so I would just love to know the journey that you guys had together because one of the thing, one of the things that we have been discussing a lot on the debriefs after the uh, the day is the interaction and the participation of the audience in this piece which is very important and we haven't talked about that this yet so how like the reactions the interactions the way the audience express themselves or they don't express themselves when they walk into the piece somehow uh, made a cut in our performance every day, in, in also, uh, we, we, we've been talking about that like a couple of days ago, like because sometimes we feel uncomfortable or we feel like vulnerable or we feel like observed by the audience in different ways. And it, it, it took us a long time to understand, at least myself, like half journey, like how important the reaction and the interaction of the audience is. And talking about political timing and the fact of showing this piece in the uh, context of this institution, of the Museum of the Modern Art, it's, it's very important. And as Gerardo was saying, like the piece, so it's, it opens more and more and more, and it becomes more clear um, and more like useful. Um, and it, it, it tells a lot. I think that we should like talk more about like the, the audience interacting with the piece. Because uh, the audience of the MoMA, it's so wide, it's so international, it's so diverse. And we were talking about that the other day. So how this piece is like a condensed um, tunnel of uh, how you could kind of like measure uh, how the people are reacting in the world to the current times and what's happening in the world. So, so talking about the journey, it is a lot. It's very complex. It's a lot of work beginning 18 years ago uh, in, in Havana and even before, right? <laughs> and even like in uh, 18th century in Cuba with the slaveries. Uh, and the most important thing uh, about this piece, for, for myself at least, the, the, the huge uh, uh, war behind it and around it, it's Cuban ident identity, right? And how we have been all the time uh, cursed some, somehow uh, for the political uh, moments, right? We have been colonized, we have, then we have like, on the 40s, on the 50s, we we always been under the radar of political conflict, and then after the Trump of the revolution, it kept going like that, and it kept going like that, and even after the you know the death of Fidel Castro, now no one no one knows what's going to happen in Cuba. That's the big question now, and uh, so yeah, I mean um, 
as I said, um, uh, it's, it's very complex, it's very big. And also um, the importance of how this piece has given us the opportunity to meet and to put together a generation of Cuban descent uh, performers and artists and under the wind and the knowledge of Tanya herself, which is a great teacher. Uh, <laughs> Um, I want like publicly like thank you like personally for for this opportunity. Thank you so much for giving me the chance, and and also like having the opportunity to to see how an institution and how and I'm gonna finish with this. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your political. It it matters, but yeah, I don't wanna I don't wanna be misunderstood. But the point is that. Art, nationality, dignity, thank you. It's what is bringing us here together to do this. So it's what we have in common, what brought us together, not what set us apart. So I think that also it's this about. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. I think that's a beautiful way to end the evening. Thank you to all of you for being here. Yeah.